afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Congressional Commitment to Modernization session. We hope you're enjoying your lunch. My name is Nicole Francis Reynolds, and I am ServiceNow's Vice President and Head of Global Government Relations. I am thrilled to lead today's very important discussion with some amazing members of Congress. We will talk about modernizing government technology, improving citizen experiences, and outlining Congress's plans to establish a secure and resilient federal government. Please join me in welcoming my amazing panelists, our amazing panelists, Congressman Jerry Connolly, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Operations and serving Virginia's 11th District, Congressman Derek Kilmer, serving Washington's 6th District, and Congressman Jim Langevin, who serves Rhode Island's 2nd District. Welcome, Congressman. To kick things off, we'll start with a question for Congressman Kilmer. For more than two years, you have chaired the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Among the recommendations made by the Select Committee are 10 focuses on modernizing and revitalizing technology in the House of Representatives. This includes the reestablishment of the Office of Technology Assessment improving IT systems, and reforming the approval process for outside technology vendors. Congressman, why is modernizing technology in the House of Representatives such an important part of making Congress more effective, efficient, and transparent? And what lessons for other federal agencies can we draw from? My colleague, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, I think had a very apt description for Congress. She said, Congress is an 18th century institution using 20th century technology to respond to 21st century problems. I think that's a pretty catchy way of describing what's actually a huge problem. And I'll give you an a few examples. You know, prior to the pandemic, bills had to be introduced in paper form. We actually had to carry a signed hard copy of the bill down to the House floor and drop it in a big wooden box called the hopper. And once COVID sent us all back to our district, it, it wasn't possible to introduce bills that traditional way. So the House had to develop an e-hopper system that allowed members to introduce bills electronically. You know, we also had to submit committee reports in paper form prior to the pandemic. Those can now be submitted electronically too. You know, so I think necessity kind of can be the mother of invention. As a child of the 70s and early 80s, I um, remember the beginning of the TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man, where they said, we have the technology, we know how to fix him. You know, but the reality is that, you know, the, the, there are great innovations that just smooth the process and help us do our jobs more efficiently for the American people. But it, it shouldn't take an emergency for us to innovate. Innovation should be built into our systems and processes so we're not caught unprepared the next time we're faced with an emergency. And in drafting our tech recommendations, we considered what successful corporations and organizations do just as a matter of course. They stay on top of the trends and update technology and IT systems regularly. They, you know, it allows them to better serve their customers and remain competitive and stay secure. And so a lot of our recommendations have been focused on having Congress do the same thing. And I, I think the lesson the federal agencies can draw from our work is just to stay focused on the American people. They deserve an effective and an efficient government and modern technology is one key way to make that happen. My next question is for all three of you esteemed members of Congress. Just 7% of federal employees are under the age of 30, like me. Okay, I'm just joking. And potentially one third of all federal employees are eligible to retire in the next several years unlike me. Based on your experience attracting and retaining talent, what do you think prospective and current federal employees expect of the technology systems they use? Do you see modernizing federal systems as key to attracting and retaining the workforce of the future? You know, um, the demographics of the federal workforce are concerning because we're not recruiting the next generation of federal employees. Seven, less than 7% of the federal workforce is under the age of 30. In the private sector, it's many multiples of that. And, th and, and uh, more than 30% uh, of all federal employees are over the age of 55, meaning they're getting ready for retirement. That, that demographic, 
is uh, really uh, of great concern. And, and as I said, it almost flips the reality in the private sector. So we've got to uh, we've got to address that problem because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of positions coming open because of retirement uh, in the next few years. So that gives us an opportunity. But if you're going to recruit the next generation, you've got to improve uh, uh, a number of things. One, one thing, I've got an internship bill that would make it easier and more systematic to have a good experience as an intern with the federal government and use that as a recruiting tool. Again, right now, we're in the single digits where, where federal interns end up being offered and accepting a federal job. Uh, in the private sector, you know, it's in the 70 to 85 percentile. So we're, you know, by, by factor of, I don't know, eight or nine, we're way behind the private sector, and that what a what a missed opportunity, right? So we gotta we gotta shore up internship programs to use them uh, to have a good experience and to recruit the next generation. We need to be more flexible in the workplace, um, and that that also has an IT component. You know, telework. Uh, we've shown in the pandemic telework works, but the next you know younger generation of of workers expect that kind of IT flexibility in their workplace. And so a, a rigid rules-based environment is not going to work for younger generations if we want to recruit them to federal uh, employment. Um, and so uh, making it a more flexible workplace. And then finally, make it easier to be hired by the federal government. I mean, it's really a complex you know, a process. Uh, I, I would argue that Frankly, when you look at how you apply for a federal job, it's discouraging. Um, and it ought to be simplified and it ought to be expedited and there ought to be feedback right away. And, uh, and I think those, are, those three things could make a huge difference in our ability to recruit. Uh, but we're not there yet. And, and you know, we're still in a very, very juridical mindset about um, becoming a federal employee. And then what you do the terms of reference within the workplace itself. And we just, that's not gonna work with younger generations. Yeah, so uh, re recruiting and retaining talent uh, is really essential to the, the, the future of strengthening the workforce, strengthening our, you know, our network, strengthening our cyber defenses and a whole level of, of things. We need that type of expertise. Uh, you know, just recruiting and retaining dedicated and, and Capable for employees is because a, a multifaceted effort, right? And and um, you know I think uh, part of that effort needs to be you know meeting the employees' basic expectations of, of having uh, technical tools, uh, work environment, and, and resources that uh, certainly that they need to succeed. Um, you know this is of course an, an ongoing effort, and certainly we've made uh, considerable progress. But I have to say, uh, you know, considerable work needs to, you know, still needs to happen. We have, we're, we're not there yet. Um, I will say that ensuring that agencies uh, employ uh, disciplined and, uh, and uh, uh, effective management, of course, will be key to continuing progress going forward. And that, of course, you know, is a, uh, it's a best practice of workforce uh, development generally, um, but it's particularly important uh, in ensuring effective planning, uh, oversight, and, uh, and governance of IT modernization projects in particular. It really is the, the you know, let me just set the stage a little for what recruitment and, and retention look like in, in Congress. You know, outside research has shown that as of 2019, about 40% of congressional staff are under the age of 30. Uh, according to a, a recent House Compensation and Diversity study, the average tenure for staff and member offices is two and a half years in their current position and just a little bit over four years in the House of Representatives writ large. So one of the biggest reasons that staff cite for their desire to leave the Hill is office culture. And while that can mean a lot of different things, there's no doubt that technology plays an essential role in Congress's ability to recruit the next generation of workers. Young workers today expect technology to just work. They've been raised in a high tech environment and are used to it working seamlessly. Government technology needs to be able to meet that standard if we're going to retain those workers. If, if the pandemic, I think, has taught us anything, it's that workers of all ages are coming to appreciate the flexibility that telework has given them 
I don't see that trend reversing. And government technology needs to be able to support a workforce that works remotely from time to time. That means ensuring that the files and software and communication devices that staffers use work seamlessly, whether they're in the office or working from home. The reason this ought to matter to the American people too, is when we see that level of turnover within Congress, it erodes the ability of Congress to solve big problems. And right now, I think the American people rightfully expect Congress to be able to solve big problems. Uh, we also see um, challenges, nature of horrors of vacuum. And when we see that level of turnover, too often what fills that void is the voices of paid lobbyists. And that I would argue doesn't reflect the needs of the American people either. And so it is important that and part of the focus of our committee has been the recruitment, retention, and diversity of staff. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly compensation is one piece of that, but so is technology. Congressman Connolly, one of the challenges in upgrading federal IT systems is the budgeting and appropriations process. Beyond the disruption caused by short-term continuing resolutions, the use it or lose it nature of most agency funding this means that there is little incentive to make one-time investments in upgrading legacy systems that will result in long-term savings and improvements in agency operations. The Modernizing Government Technology, also known as the MGT Act, and the Technology Modernization Fund, also known as TMF, are important steps in the right direction. But Congress has not yet, unfortunately, provided funding levels that meet the scope of these challenges. My question to you is, how can we work together to support funding streams and mechanisms that break the cycle of throwing money at legacy systems that don't provide the customer experience that the American people deserve? So, you know, the federal government is kind of a hodgepodge when it comes to IT, right? So. Uh, we had uh, thousands of sort of siloed data centers, and we needed to consolidate them and achieve real savings, which we've, we're doing. Uh, we had all kinds of email systems, uh, some of which weren't compatible and couldn't talk one to the other. Some agencies had, you know, dozens uh, within the same agency. Um, and uh, so trying to... Uh, modernize, upgrade, uh, and uh, make ourselves more efficient is kind of the goal. Legacy systems are a problem because they're big, they're expensive, they consume a lot of energy, and, and the number of people who know even how to write them, uh, run them or write the language for them is dwindling. You know, I don't know how many people are left to know COBOL. But there are systems at some very large agencies that uh, our legacy run systems, like say at the IRS, for example, and they are also not cyber secure. Um, and so uh, replacing them is the name of the game, but you put your finger on it in the question, how do we incentivize people to do that? So, well, if, if you're the head of an agency and you honestly want to retire those legacy systems and have a whole new upgraded system put in place, that's a multi-year, multi-billion dollar effort. And that means you've got to commit that in your budget. And you also probably have to commit toward this effort, knowing you're not going to be there when it's completed. Because, you know, the average lifespan of a political uh, appointee in senior management in a federal agency, you know, is about 18 months. So you might start out saying, no, I want to do that. And then along comes some emergency or some unforeseen event or someone cuts your budget. And all of a sudden that priority of retiring those legacy systems falls in you, even though you wanted to do the right thing. And so, uh, you know, making sure we've got the management team in place that understands how critical this is to the future of the agency and its mission, uh, and making sure the resources are there to incentivize you to do it. You know, although we spend about $100 billion a year at the federal level on IT, much of that is already spoken for in maintaining existing systems, including legacy systems. So getting some, some catalyst, some some investment capital, if you will, to incentivize you to go ahead with that reform is really critical. And that's where the 
technology management fund comes into play. And um, in the past, to your question about appropriations, uh, it was zero. And we, we, we finally got the House Appropriations Subcommittee to give it $25 million. Well, that's not going to incentivize anybody. And in the last uh, iteration of legislation, we were able to get a billion dollars uh, restored to the technology management fund. Now that's considerably below what President Biden originally wanted, which was 8 billion, but it's a good start. We already have proposals into OMB that exceed $2 billion. So we know the demand is there and I think going forward, we're gonna be able to persuade members of Congress that this is an investment we have to make. Uh, but you've gotta have some seed capital, you've gotta have some incentive financially for managers to take that plunge and replace those legacy systems. My next question is for Congressman Langevin. Congressman Langevin, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges agencies face today? in terms of procuring technology and staying on top of the innovation curve? Yeah, bu budgets are always a, a big thing, uh, of course. Um, you know, local, state, and federal government face, you know, fiscal constraints all the time, and you're always competing for dollars. But, you know, I, I think we, you know, we still have a lot of work to do in, in the, the, the modernization of critical uh, legacy IT systems, which are, you know, are still too prevalent uh, among government agencies. Again, that goes to local, state, and federal. Uh, some of these systems are, are dozens of years old uh, and uh, you know, no longer supported with, uh, with software updates uh, and uh, are, are written in older programming languages that, that really aren't widely used anymore. Uh, all of the, uh, this makes you know, maintaining those systems uh, more costly and defending them next to next to impossible in a lot of ways. Um, so upgrading from these legacy systems is, is fundamentally you know, a resource problem. As we talk about uh, you know, it's, it, the technology uh, modernization fund, of course, helps agencies to obtain uh, those resources. Um, the, the, the $1 billion uh, to the, uh, uh, the TMF in uh, the American Rescue Plan um, uh, Act last year was a much needed investment that's a real shot in the arm toward to meeting those resource needs. And I'd have to say that as, you know, as agencies do move to procure new uh, technologies, uh, supply chain risk and, and management is uh, you know, also a, 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 key, a key challenge. So um, we've, we've seen numerous cyber attacks that leverage software supply chains uh, for access, something really to be, to be mindful of. Uh, and know, you know we are, the, the bad guys are looking, so we need to make sure they're closing off that avenue of vulnerability. And you know, supply chain risk management is therefore you know, critical for uh, reinforcing federal cybersecurity as uh, IT modernization progress. So I guess I'll just wind up by saying, you know, I also think that the, the widespread shift to remote uh, work you know, caused by COVID-19 pandemic has complicated modernization efforts for sure. And CIOs have had, you know, to, to think about uh, technology uh, procurement and security considerations in the context of, uh, of certainly of, of, of rapidly uh, changing requirements for proper network management. So no shortage of challenges, uh, but at least, you know, we could identify the scope of the problem. Now we've got to get to work on solving it. And resources will help go a long way to, to fixing things. I'd like to ask this one to Congressman Kilmer and Congressman Connolly. On December 13, 2021, President Biden signed an executive order designed to improve customer experience and service delivery for the American people and reduce the time tax that many Americans encounter when claiming federal benefits, financing a business, or filing their taxes. Key to that effort is modernizing IT systems and piloting new online tools and technologies. What customer experiences would you most like to see improved for the people you represent? And what are key considerations to ensure that technology helps us deliver those services efficiently, effectively, and securely? There's a few things that come to mind. I think for members of Congress, quality customer service often means quality casework on behalf of our constituents. Literally half of my district staff 
does casework, just trying to help constituents that are navigating a problem with the federal government, whether that be Social Security or the VA issue or an immigration issue or IRS problem or Lately, it's been a lot of folks who are traveling for the first time in a long time and didn't realize their passport was expired. And so the select committee recently held a hearing on modernizing district offices and improving the systems we use for doing casework. Um, you know, we're also planning another hearing on how to create a more customer friendly Congress and technology will be a big part of that discussion, too. I think there are several ways to improve the customer experience for constituents when they interact with the federal government. For example, one recurring frustration that I hear from constituents is that they never know where their queries to a federal agency stands. Why, you know, why is it possible for me to track the status of my pizza order in real time, but not my service request with a federal agency? You know, another example, the Cases Act of 2019 mandated agencies to allow the use of e-signatures on various casework forms. And that act, unfortunately, has faced some resistance from some agencies and has yet to be fully implemented. In 2022, we shouldn't be asking people to print out hard copies and fax documents on a regular basis. So those are a couple things that come immediately to mind. Now, Congressman Connolly, the same question to you. What customer experiences would you like to see improved for the people you represent? And what are the key considerations to ensure that technology helps us deliver those services efficiently and effectively? From my point of view, uh, the weakness in a lot of government portals, websites uh, and the like is they're complex. You have to do multiple clicks to try to find where you're supposed to go. They're not user-friendly uh, and we need to change that. And the pandemic kind of proved that, right? So in addition to the services you listed, um, you know, during the pandemic, people needed to be able to get on the SBA website and try to access loans and grants to keep their small businesses open, uh, especially people who weren't used to going to SBA for that kind of assistance. But remember, we increased the SBA portfolio by 30-fold in one month, we went from 20 billion to 600 billion. Supplemental nutrition assistance programs, especially with schools closed, a lot of families found that their kids weren't getting that daily school lunch, you know, that they were getting at school, they needed supplemental uh, assistance. Uh, unemployment uh, insurance, I mean, the, the system was just overwhelmed at the beginning of the pandemic. Unemployment, you know, shot up you know, to the double digits, millions of people were flooding, uh, you know, various portals, both at the state and federal level. We changed eligibility to make it easier for more people to participate. We increased the benefits at the federal level. Um, but all of that overwhelmed, you know, 50 state unemployment insurance IT systems. So, uh, we need to we need to improve that. The president's executive order is a very important first step. Uh, I've introduced legislation known as the FACE Act to make it easier for agencies to collect voluntary feedback on customers' experience, because right now, current law actually makes it very difficult to collect that kind of basic feedback. Um, and if we're going to improve, we've got to have feedback from the customer, right? Any retail, any private sector entity would do that. So we've got a ways to go. Uh, the pandemic, I think, really showed strengths and weaknesses we want to enhance those strengths and address those weaknesses to make it easier for American, the American people to access their government at any level. Congressman Langevin, how do you think federal agencies should be leveraging automation to improve FATARA and FISMA compliance, as well as other audit requirements? Yeah, so great question. Thanks for, for raising it. You know, I think automation has significant uh, potential in, in so many ways to improve agency reporting uh, for these, these regimes. Um, you know, manual data collection can result in agencies developing uh, complicated internal processes and a lot of ways to, to store information in spreadsheets or even, uh, or even word processors. Uh, you know, that data is is not always uh, you know, stored in um, in common uh, format, uh, which which means that you know once it's once it's shared, uh, it, it takes additional work 
you buy in order in, in, in order to uh, format uh, it, before it you know it actually uh, before actually analyzing it. So moving uh, to a standard framework um, that that uses the, the same machine readable data formats uh, across different different agencies would make it easier. I, I believe it faster uh, for those agencies to you know document the the, the, the state and um, and uh, and um, and uh, security of their, their IT systems. It would also uh, make it easier to, to share the, the data uh, in other ways for, for evaluation and, uh, and uh, reuse across the, the interagency. Uh, I would say that OMB appears to recognize this. Uh, it's new uh, FISMA guidance from December uh, 2021 uh, actually directed the, uh, the, the development of a strategy uh, to enable uh, automation of, of, of FISMA reporting which makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, which to me is uh, really, it's an encouraging sign of, of progress. This question is for Congressman Connolly. Often across the federal enterprise, IT funds are managed more by program offices and not by the CIO. As federal IT funding has grown, CIO authority for oversight and governance in some cases has not kept up. Do you think that this lack of authority holds CIOs back from fulfilling their missions? And do you think that CIOs should be empowered to manage and track hardware and software assets at an enterprise level uh, across their agencies? So if you ask almost any private entity, any corporation, how many CIOs do you have? in the company, their answer is almost always going to be, well, what do you mean? We have, we have one. Right. Um, and in the federal agency, when we wrote the FITARA bill, um, there were 240 people with the title CIO spread across 24 agencies. And that meant a management system of this, right? That's not me, that's him or her. And nobody was in charge and nobody was accountable. So one of the goals uh, we have, and, and that's reflected in the Fatara scorecard uh, that I created, is to have a primary CIO for every agency who reports to the boss. Because the other thing we know about how you know, entities work is if your title is you know, deputy assistant director for widgets and your office is in the bowels of the basement and nobody ever sees you, and you, you absolutely don't have the ear of the boss, anything you tell me with respect to IT is odd referendum, right? It's fascinating that you think that, and uh, certainly we'll get around to looking at that. Whereas if, if I know that, no, you, you report directly to the boss, you're talking to him or her every day. And when you say something to me on your portfolio, uh, I better listen. I, you know, I, I better act on that. I can't afford to ignore that. And so making sure that we have direct reporting uh, for the CIA, CIO is really critical. So the org chart is actually meaningful, but also to your other point, empowering that CIO to have decision-making over everything from software to intellectual property to uh, making investments to retire those legacy systems we talked about, all of that is critical to the mission. And let that person take responsibility and be accountable, but have responsibility, have that power to make those decisions. Um, that's how we effectuate change. That's how we make a modern IT-based federal uh, government. Um, and that's how we serve our constituents. So I think that's really a critical matter. Um, it looks like a personnel management issue, and in some, in some respects it is, but it is also critical as an ingredient to reforming how we manage and procure IT in the federal government. Congressman, I have one final question for all three of you. If you are able to share a sneak peek with us, tell us what are you working on legislatively in Congress uh, that focuses on IT modernization and will possibly help the federal government modernize its IT? Congressman Connolly, we'll start with you. Well, there are two major pieces of legislation coming down the pike that our committee has reported out multiple times. 
One is my FedRAMP legislation, uh, which, as you know, is the entity at GSA that certifies private companies that want to provide cloud computing services to the federal government. And we want to streamline that process. We want to make it a lot less cumbersome and less expensive uh, as it was originally designed to do. We also want to codify it in law and we want to create a presumption of adequacy so that if you go to one federal agency and you get certified, you don't have to go to 23 others and start all over again. Um, and so we think that can save a lot of money and create a lot of competition and opportunity for new entry uh, in serving the federal government with that set of services. And we think that's critical. And moving federal agencies to the cloud, working with private partners, private sector partners, really important. Um, the CIA has done that. So if the CIA thinks it's pretty secure to do that, uh, so should civilian agencies as well. The other legislation that's coming down the pike that's just uh, kind of started is FISMA reauthorization. And that really goes to cyber. Um, how is the federal government organized and how well are we in terms of resilience in fending off cyber attacks and protecting the assets? And um, that's just you know really an ongoing critical effort. I mean, if you look at the number of cyber attacks on federal agencies, you know it, it's just grown exponentially. It's hundreds of thousands a year. Um, and and sometimes you know yes, we get it about a cyber attack on the Pentagon or the Homeland Security or CIA, but there are cyber attacks on CDC and FDA uh, trying to get at intellectual property. You know, as we're developing vaccines or strategies for disease management, and uh, those are expensive research efforts that the U.S. taxpayer funds, and there's a lot of proprietary information, and there are all kinds of outside actors probing our systems to try to get at it so that it's free to them. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have to do a much better job of protecting uh, federal assets, intellectual property, especially in research and development efforts. So those two bills are, are, are still very much alive. And uh, I, I would expect action on both of them in, the, in this second session of the 117th Congress. Sure. I can give you a, a couple uh, clues and a little bit of insight uh, to what we're working on. Um, so I think one uh, process to watch for is uh, FedRAMP, FedRAMP um, uh, authorization. So um, FedRAMP, is, as many of your viewers probably know, is, uh, is the program within the, uh, the General Services Administration that standardizes uh, security assessments and, and authorizations for cloud products that are used by uh, the federal government. And in this case, you know, the House passed the, the FedRAMP Authorization Act, uh, which would enshrine the program uh, in statute in early uh, 2021. Uh, the Senate right now uh, uh, has uh, is now uh, passed FedRAMP back to the House as uh, as part of the uh, the strengthening American uh, Cybersecurity Act, which also includes language to to modernize FISMA, which is which is encouraging. Um, so through FISMA reform. I believe that you know we have uh, we have an opportunity to uh, improve security elements um, of, of IT modernization, shifting away uh, from uh, from uh, compliance based uh, system to one predicated on risk management. So we're not just kind of checking the box, if you will. And uh, you know we also have the opportunity to better define the roles that that CISA and the the office of the National Cyber Director play in the FISMA regime. Uh, you know, neither existed during the, the last uh, FISMA update. And on the, on the House side, uh, FISMA is the, um, you know, the purview uh, of the Committee on Oversight and, uh, and, and Reform, um, and, which has also been uh, closely examining uh, this issue. I think it's important that we, we certainly get this right. And I do know that uh, the Chairwoman Maloney and, and Chairman Peters are, are jointly committed to, to ensuring that that our um, our federal uh, information system, uh, security is uh, in, a, in a in a strong position as it as it can be, and I have to say I'm at, at this point, you know, seeing the progress that the the bill is making, the provisions are making, 
uh, I'm confident that we'll see a final bill on, on its way to the president's desk very soon. Fingers crossed. I, I, I hope I'm not being overly optimistic, but um, you know, I, I tend to be conservative in these assessments. I, you know, I know it's, you know, how challenging it can be to get important, even, even important legis uh, legislation to the Congress. And sometimes things move at a snail's pace, but I think we have, uh, we have momentum here and um, I'm optimistic that we'll see a bill to the president soon. You know, one thing I'm interested in is ensuring that the agencies continue to implement the Evidence Act of 2018. The Evidence Act was the most expansive effort undertaken by the federal government to change policies and increase the country's data infrastructure so that we're increasing the capability of lawmakers to actually engage in evidence-based policymaking. And the bill included some provisions that I drafted to ensure that public data is made more available in 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 a machine readable format that, that so that people and organizations, public or private and other government offices can search easily. Um, the, the bill also required federal agencies to hire chief data officers and evaluation officers and statistical officers to coordinate and oversee and advise different elements of evaluation and data and uh, statistical policy issues. So I actually think implementation of that evidence act is, is really important. You know, it is, is requiring agencies to rethink and modernize their systems for collecting data and making it available in user-friendly ways. And we're seeing tremendous opportunities for partnership between the public sector and the private sector. You know, if, you, if you're if you from, you know, I, I represent a coastal district, you know, the, the coolest app that you can get to look at waves, um, you know, for folks who wanna go surfing off of our coast, you know, come from NOAA, uh, NOAA database, right? The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, right? You get, every time you check the weather app on your phone, that's access to government data. And so you're seeing real opportunities for a partnership between the public and private sector, both in ways that can drive innovation, that can create new jobs, create new innovations, but also in a way where um, uh, where we where government can get better at adopting new innovations uh, uh, that's also providing an opportunity to um, better serve our constituents and better serve the American people. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of your invaluable insights. On behalf of our CEO, Bill McDermott, and over 17,000 employees around the world, we really do look forward to continuing our effort to work with you to modernize Congress and to figure out how to best deliver these citizen services in a streamlined, secure, and efficient way. Thanks for all that you are doing in Congress, and we look forward to seeing future legislative efforts to support establishing a resilient federal government. Thank you so much again. We look forward to seeing you around the Hill uh, again soon. Steve? Back to you.